Hi there. This is wonderful, I, isn't it? It goes in and yes, out. <laughs> yes. I, I, I just jumped in in the middle of your last two minutes. Okay. So I heard something about from the bottom up. I heard something <laughs> about greening and I heard something. So uh, uh, which way would you like to go right now? Anyway. I think I just heard um, unintended, uh, unintended, uh, unintended, yeah. uh, unintended yeah. consequences. <laughs> well, we were talking about funding, that when yeah. you fund something, if the state funds something, how does it then evaluate whether that funding was successful? And I was mm -hmm. talking that I've had nice conversations with Francis Morris, who you might know, the head of the Tate Modern on this issue, how the mm -hmm. Tate gets evaluated by the Treasury. <laughs> um, <you> know, <laughs> <laughs> and what do they come up with? How do they evaluate that? We need that? a better that we need a better valuation. You know, so this this notion of cost benefit analysis, net present value, and all these kind of static cost uh, and, and and benefit metrics don't capture. We were saying all the kind of random stuff that happens along the way. So if a museum is really trying to redefine even what does art mean, who is an artist with a much wider community than those who've been allowed to exhibit their art in the past and also bring in new people to the museum who've never been to the museum. That's a very important you know, mission of a museum like the Tate, but if it gets evaluated just by ticket sales, for example, uh, which of course will be much higher with blockbuster shows, you know, the Picassos and the Matisse kind of exhibits, then that's difficult. And tell, what, tell me about what your- what is this mandate for expanding who uh, the number of people who are artists? Is it, uh, do you think it's a, a kind of a policy uh, that people in museums decide to do? Or I'm, is it a yeah. response to things that are just happening? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't work in, in the museum, but what was interesting to me was that she was saying, as I think other people that I've, <laughs> I've heard talk about how the funding affects what they do you know, the big yeah. point is finance isn't neutral. So how money comes in, whether it's public money or private money into a museum or any form of art or the healthcare sector, how the money comes in, the structures of that funding, how it then gets evaluated, whether it was successful or failure actually mm -hmm. affects what happens on the ground. Um, yeah. and, and unfortunately there's not enough recognition of that. So you might have a sector that's emerging and they say, oh, we need more money. We need more finance without paying attention to what is the form of that finance. Yeah. I've watched the number of museum goers in, in New York, uh, you know, more or less become 10 times what they were when I first started going to museums. It's overwhelming. Uh, so I, I would imagine it's very hard to evaluate um, the um, effect of, of expanding your audience like that. Yeah. Um, but those I are private I'm, museums, right? Don't they mainly charge very high? Very high. Well, um, uh, some of them have free uh, moments, and right. uh, but um, I think it's. Uh, I had to confront my own snobbery, I guess, uh, to uh, when I had to fight suddenly. You know, hundreds of people who were you know, getting selfies with, with works of art. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I was, uh, uh, and now, of course, it's, we're, we're back to empty museums here in New York, and it's quite um, wonderful. Again, in a, in a snobbish sort of way, all the tourists have gone, and, uh, and I imagine yeah. it's like that in many cities across the world, and you realize who lives here. Yeah. And the people who live here are really, like, like oddballs, you know, and when the- <laughs> Do you mean New Yorkers? <laughs> yeah, anyone who really decides to come to a place that's so kind of quirky yeah. um, uh, with such uh, strange arrangements for uh, uh, living is, um, I think has to put up with a lot and, and, and we're, uh, is it, um, What's your feeling? Is it like that in other cities that have suddenly become local? Um, so I'm in London now, but I just had a, an incredible experience in Rome, which is where I'm from. I'm Italian, where I, I brought my daughters and we were the only people in the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> Imagine that <laughs> in terms of uh, uh, wonderful. But I think, I mean, it's interesting. Not every city 
uh, that I've lived in has a real sense, for example, of, of public space and spaces where people actually meet or even have space to meet. So London has these wonderful you know, public parks. Um, Italy has wonderful public squares, but so many cities I think in the US kind of lack that, right? Everyone, I mean, New York obviously is different, San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, but many Americans, um, I grew up in New Jersey, uh, live in places where you don't have those kind of, you know, places where you might randomly meet when you, you know, have, whether it's fewer tourists or just fewer cars going around. So I assume that experience of, of having fewer people on the streets, how it's been experienced and the kind of conversations it might have engendered on the street will have been different if we're talking about cities or places where everyone's in their car versus where they're walking, like New York City. Yeah. You feel that you've met new people. Mm, yeah, it's also, um, the, it does remind me of the 70s here because it's, um, it's darker earlier. It's people are getting knocked on the head more often, a lot of muggings. And um, it's, uh, uh, but it, it's um, also a much uh, friendlier place. <laughs> I, I like it a lot. Um, yeah. The um, I haven't spent that much time in the city in the last few months and I've been outside of it. And so each time I come, I see another version of, of what's going on. We're trying to do a lot of um, events now because artists and, and writers and, and uh, musicians in, in, this, in this city have been very quiet in the last mm -hmm. few months. And we're just realizing with our election coming up uh, in a few weeks that um, it suddenly is really shocking how uh, little people have from the cultural world have set and contributed to the to the national arguments. We it's, that's um, interesting because yeah, I feel like that's true. I don't know about in New York, but in London where I live, I've been asking a lot of my uh, arts friends, but also architects and designers, why they're so silent always. I mean, even pre-COVID. So as an economist, we're always, you know, writing in the Guardian or whatever about uh, our opinions, you know, whether it's about austerity or the lack of proper green investments, et cetera. Um, and we have a debate. And, and I wonder sometimes, is it that the papers and the news media just aren't asking the artists what they think, or are they just kind of sitting back and not feeling the urge to, to have a more explicit debate? And I'm not talking about the kind of um, specialized, for example, journals or, or mediums within the arts world, but for the general public to know what you think. Mm -hmm. For example, in London, how the city itself has been changing architecturally. You never read the architects writing saying, oh, that was wrong because we should have done X, Y, and Z. Um, you don't read it, You, you don't, you don't hear that. And when <laughs> I asked them why, they said because they work on commission. <laughs> so they don't want to make a fuss. <laughs> Sorry, what were you saying? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I know the answer to why artists and, uh, and uh, writers are so quiet. I think perhaps because the speed of of um, communication is so uh, blindingly fast that as soon as you jump into that, it, it's gone onto another topic completely. Huh. So um, I, I think I think that's part of it, um, and uh, and also the, there's so many things going on simultaneously here right now to fracture everybody's attention. Mm. Um, at sort of a, a, a catastrophe on, on, on many different levels. I get a, a lot of calls every day from my friends in California who can't breathe, you know, so the fire. fires are so. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. so we have, we're, we're really being pulled in from one emergency to another. And yeah. we're just beginning to think how we can uh, begin to shape some other kind of story because uh, the, the whole technique of, of uh, how stories are being produced here is uh, make them very fast, make them very uh, um, frightening. And, and, and uh, he said, what? You know, you, and really shocking to people. So it's, I think it's partly that, um, that it's just one shock after another, I would say. 
Interesting. Um, but do you think that's changed over time? I mean, artists, you know, whether you think of the Bauhaus movement or other periods where, you know, uh, there was actually a movement within the arts confronting a social, economic, political situation. Why don't we have kind of, or, or maybe we do, and I just don't know. I'm probably quite ignorant about what's happening in the arts world, but do you feel that this silentness that you're talking about and, and why that might be has changed over time? Because surely back in the Bauhaus years, there was also speed of the level that you were talking about before, but there was maybe more commitment or more collective action, like artists were talking to each other and working together, reacting to something or no? I think uh, the, the romance of speed at that point attracted artists and that it, that it seemed futuristic. <laughs> and now I think most of the people I know are, are not interested in trying to define some kind of future. They're, they're just like, they've had it with, one billion TED Talks that try to go, oh, the future is going to be X or Y, and realizing that we're in it right now, that this is it, and that uh, minute by minute. And so I think people are mm. are burning out on on uh, the these kinds of um, predictions. And also, um, I, I think, but I really think speed has a lot to do with this somehow. I mean, I hadn't really thought about it until mm. we were, uh, you're also just saying, you know, the in unintended consequences of the internet, which are which are fracturing, uh, you know, fracturing minds, <laughs> you know, yeah. and that, um, and that I think your example of the, the, for example, the futurists and did they how engaged were they? I I'm not the person to to comment on that. I'm not really sure yeah. how engaged they were. Yeah. Um, I think that I know that artists I know uh, are are kind of. I would say burned out on speed. Yeah. And um, uh, the storytelling. That... I mean, you're sorry. I'll let you finish. What were you saying? No, I was just going to say one of my um, meditation teachers came up with a really good formula, which I liked very much. Which he said, you know, if you think um, technology can solve your problems, mm -hmm. uh, you don't understand technology, and you don't understand your problems. Your prob That's and awesome. I'm going to write like that down. Very, <laughs> yeah. Does, um, the, the speed. Uh, if you want it faster, mm -hmm. go right ahead, knock yourself out, find all those great solutions that'll have like this. Um, so I think most of the people I know now have deeply appreciated the, the uh, things becoming very slow and, um, yeah. and, and genuinely don't want to go back on the, the merry-go-round of, of yeah. progress and sure. Um, and progress and predictions also that yeah. um, uh, so um, I and I would I would feel the same way what about you are you uh, did you enjoy the slowdown I did in the sense I, I spent much more time with my four teenagers which was a pleasure and they seemed to even want to be <laughs> with us or at least they pretended. we went every day for a walk you know, at, at least during the lockdown, there was one hour a day we were allowed out and it was just such a nice thing to, you know, be expecting to come. I don't know if you remember in the book, The Little Prince, when he, I, I think it was, he was yelling at the fox. He said, don't just show up, uh, you know, tell me you're going to come so I can warm up my heart <laughs> in expectation. Okay. And I felt like every day I was warming up my heart, knowing that at six o'clock we'd go walk on this wonderful park here in London called Hampstead Heath. So that was fantastic. But a lot of my work is um, with governments and, you know, including, for example, the government of South Africa and the level of inequality that many you know, countries have, um, that creates a massive problem when you have something like a pandemic, you know, that inequality just gets worse. And so, yes, I had more time with my kids, but I was reminded and, you know, every Zoom call I was having with the different COVID task force is just the misery and the tragedy that was happening on the ground. So there was always that that weird kind of schizophrenic moment of, on the one hand, feeling very cozy with my family, um, but being, you know, reminded of the very difficult social, economic, political <laughs> situation outside, not as a philosophy, you know, not as a something abstract, but literally with the people I was speaking to. So literally. Um, coming up with a strategy for the future for, for a situation like that. I mean, to, because yeah. you can see where it's going, it's like a Greek tragedy, you know where that's going. Yeah. And so to, to shape it somehow, how do, you, how do you approach shaping something like that? 
when well, you can the first see thing, the yeah, I mean, coming back to your point about speed, you know, think of all the language we've been using around speed, the race for a vaccine, right? Quick, quick, a vaccine. And, and then we don't govern that process properly, right? If the vaccine has to be universal and globally accessible, <laughs> we're going to have to govern, you know, the patent system and all sorts of things in particular ways to make sure that it achieves what we're actually trying to achieve with it. And I think when you have so much speed, for example, with the recovery, we have to grow again. We need to get people you know, back to work. Um, the problem is that how that recovery, literally the recovery package that a government might provide, for example, to business, if it's not structured properly, it's a massively missed opportunity. So you know, there's trillions being thrown into the system right now, just like after the financial crisis. But if those trillions aren't structured to actually build a better future, then we're just going to you know, be putting money into the source of the next crisis. So on that, what, what I find refreshing always is the differences between experiences. So France, for example, and Denmark have put very strong conditionality around the bailouts. In Denmark, you cannot get a penny from the government if you're using tax havens. How smart is that? <laughs> or in France, yeah. there's conditionality with the car manufacturers and the airlines. They had to reduce their carbon emissions if they were going to get some of the recovery funds. Anyway, I'm very interested in those kind of details. How can we actually, in some ways, yeah. slowly <laughs> think about this, even though we immediately you know, provide the help, but think, think it through so that we're actually structuring even the contracts between, say, the state and business in such a way that's towards a goal of having, say, a more inclusive, sustainable economy. And it's, it's possible to do, but not if you just say, we need to bail out business. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, what if the relationship between state and business is, is uh, uh, tilted in the way that the US is, for example, because our, right. our state is being dismantled. Absolutely. So exactly. how do you- uh, And you don't have that? public health. <laughs> We don't have public transportation. The post office is being dismantled. Our, yeah. our um, structure is being dismantled. So when you talk about the balance, uh, it, it, uh, it's all market here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but, you know, uh, it's also like that in good times in the U.S. They, they often, you know, socialize the risks with, with public funding and then privatize uh, the mm -hmm. rewards. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the whole Silicon Valley experiment, the fact that the public school system is so bad. In, in that part of the world. And yet, you know, the wealth of those companies to a large extent came from public funds. You know, that's, that's crazy. Well, but if it um, doesn't make so much of a difference, then you just weather it? No, no. I mean, I, I think we need to remember that the economy is an outcome of how we make decisions to govern state institutions, yeah. private sector institutions. So corporate governance is really important. Companies that are just driven by shareholder value, <laughs> that's a problem, but also how these interrelationships occur. Um, mm -hmm. And all of that can be restructured. We can change corporate governance models to be more stakeholder driven. We can change how government works to actually have much more public purpose. We were talking before with Theodore about public value and we can change the relationships to be more symbiotic and less parasitic. <laughs> Literally at the contract level, we need lawyers to help us write better contracts. Yeah, we I've do. Never said do. We need and better we need lawyers. Who understand those issues, I think, because yeah. uh, here, I think we've almost given up because it's so overwhelming to try to uh, move in into government to change it. You know, it's... it's um, uh, but do you feel... Do you feel that government at the city level, because you've been talking about New York, at the city and state level, I feel there's more interesting things happening in the U.S. than at the federal level. Would you agree um, that the city government is? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I've been active in my little town in the, the end of East Hampton. So and we're trying to um, uh, we had a big campaign for somebody who's running against a uh, a um, very entrenched uh, Republican, and uh, she's a scientist, and uh, was kind of selling that as as her main skill that she uh, could see where, um, uh, particularly in ecology, because that part of Long Island is very much about erosion and the ocean, and and so she's kind of an expert in that. Um, but the uh, and, and we try to support that as as much as possible, but. Um, the smear machine is is really powerful there, yeah. and yeah. so 
uh, every single point that was made about that was um, kind of dismantled through uh, a, a huge and powerful campaign of ridicule. Mm. So it was, um, it became very, very difficult to, wow. um, I, I don't think she's going to win. I shouldn't say that. She's, she's yeah. going to win. <laughs> You know, but with with our our greatest efforts of of, of trying to uh, point out uh, that um, the the actual situation, uh, as opposed to um, this kind of fictional idea of what uh, is going on with with uh, mm. um, let's just use ecology there for example, uh, it it was uh, so overwhelming for us because there was so much. Um, energy coming from the other side to yeah. kind of erase her message. Wow. But well, you said before, you used the word story and storytelling. And do you feel that behind that kind of, you know, anger and and, um, and propaganda in some ways that, that you know, came her way, um, there's also that the stories have been captured, the, the ability to tell stories has been captured by particular interests and that progressives aren't telling stories that are, understandable no. enough and maybe you know simplicity and simple don't have to be the same thing you know a simplistic story is not the same thing as a simple story but if we don't know how to tell simple stories like you know make america make america great again <laughs> which is a very simplistic terrible story but still what is you know what are the big headline stories and messages that progressives in the u.s you think are you know like what's what's biden's story that people could actually understand that is, of course, the the point is these stories are very, very simplistic. And ever since Karl Rove decided, you know, it's going to be the people who tell the best stories who are going to win, yeah. the simplest one. Um, and when he said, okay, uh, because people in government never thought that a good story was important before he kind of went, we're going to control the narrative. And right. and so we're going to give you a very, very simple story to understand. And... and um, Gossip is gossip and anger and blaming are are stories that have a lot of punch, you know. And so the the, the make it America great again is, while it seems to have a positive um, uh, narrative, it's uh, uh, very much about um, uh, what people don't want, you know. Yeah. So, and that's very appealing yeah. uh, at the moment. Uh, because people are very frightened that this is a very out of con out of control. Because really, the that I, I guess the dominant story, if I had to make it super simple, <laughs> was that was that the world is getting hotter and um, and smaller and and more dangerous. And and so, what do we do about that? So when there's a simple solution, people take it. Um, and uh, and other things about generosity get drowned in the, in that in that. Yeah. Um, so we have we have a, a, a um, series of events called Ruckus, uh, which are, we're, we're organizing now for uh, with uh, in collaboration with Get Out the Vote uh, mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. and it's uh, a, a lot of artists and musicians and writers in New York uh, doing a few days of of events, mm -hmm. uh, not. Uh, with um, uh, here's the thing, uh, partisan is a very weird word here now because hmm. after the last election, I I thought, well, we we just spent this whole time slinging stupid slogans around without ever talking about anything in any with any kind of <laughs> um, yeah. uh, depth, and so so uh, I. At the end of the, the the election, I made a proposal uh, to a bunch of libraries in the United mm -hmm. States, uh, mainly to the very big ones, um, because I thought, okay, what what really connects us now? Not yeah. the internet any, any longer. It's just a bunch of sales tools and gossip and fury. But how could we connect the country? And I was like, libraries. Nice. So we have a huge New York Public Library, a huge yeah. one in LA. The major libraries are are big and then they, they branch out into all sorts of tiny ones and every little tiny town has a library. So I thought, what if we had a year of national conversations that were one thing a month uh, and they would be 
uh, ecology, there would be uh, human rights, there would be women's rights, there would be um, uh, mass incarceration. Anyway, so um, I got these, um, began to get a lot of energy into that project. And then I was informed by uh, the library in New York that of course, we could have these discussions. Good idea, but they could not be partisan. I said, okay, wow. yeah. let me just ask you a question. Would if the first one we'd like to do is freedom of speech, um, you wouldn't consider that partisan, would you? And I said, we would. Wow. So I said, that's, can't the talk about anything. <laughs> that's the end of the conversation. There's wow. no way to have a dialogue that yeah. isn't a screaming argument with intelligent, yeah. people on one side and other people kind of going, no, not, you know, so it's, it's, uh, I don't know what to do about this part. Wow. I don't know what to do about the screaming match in the sense that everybody feels that they're right. And those other people are just uninformed. Yeah. So, you know, we had a similar idea here in, um, well, in Europe, but also specifically in the UK around both strengthening public libraries, but also connecting them more exactly. As you say, for example, the British library is famous all over the world, but it's not really connected with all these small neighborhood libraries. So imagine, you know, mm -hmm. the British libraries where Karl Marx wrote his, uh, <laughs> actually he wrote in the British Museum, which anyway, they're connected. Um, so the problem is a lot of the, a lot of the funding that has actually gone to the public library system is precisely what's been cut in the last 10 years. In the right. UK. So unfortunately, right. all the attention was just to save them, right? Which of course is very important. We need the public libraries, but the bigger ambition if they actually existed was also how do you bring to the public library, exactly as you're saying, the most you know, dynamic 21st century kind of debates and use them, not you know, this obsession with the internet as the vehicle through which you foster debate, but also connect them to other public institutions. Like in the UK, we have, um, you know, government digital services, which has set up this great government website. We have, again, the British Museum, the British Library, the Turing Institute, but, but they're not really connected. They don't work together to be kind of this disruptive, funky force oh, that think about citizen debate. Yeah. They're all siloed yeah. in their own so, little domains. Yeah, shaping a community, so key. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that the, the fracturing of that is is what we're seeing now, is, is and the and the uh, narrowing channels uh, means that it's harder to, to, I remember when I was growing up, uh, there, were, there were a lot of different um, beliefs in the little town in the Midwest and, and some people were kind of Republicans and some were Democrats and they, everyone really got along, even though they were quite radically different views of how um, to live in the world, how to be part of a community but everyone was more generous and people are less generous now. Do you feel that? Yes, but also they're more siloed. I mean, I think there used to be my good friend, Cornelia Parker, who's an artist. I don't know if you know her work. She's fantastic. In fact, I, I have one of her uh, prints back there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, look, up, look her up. She's wonderful. She tells me I that will. how artists were funded back then and the kinds of people that could even enter the arts. It was much easier for someone like her from you know, working class background in the North of England to become an artist today, you know, it's, it's much harder actually, at least in the UK. Um, there's a very, you know, in, in some ways the class system. Is, well, I mean, if, I don't want to sound obsessed that all I can talk about is public funding, but the public funding of the arts <laughs> has, uh, ha, has reduced. So again, who, you know, what we opened up with in our conversation, just how permeable the arts are to, to different classes, to different backgrounds has unfortunately, at least for the training, the ability for people to come in from very different backgrounds and be trained and be invested in has been uh, reduced when you um, when you have such a, a fall in the public funding, which is supposed to open up the opportunities in that kind of Amartya Sen kind of way, right? Opportunities and capabilities that create our ability to access the best. Uh, yeah, yeah. It is, it is true that you have to appeal uh, to a different a group of people to get funding now. So, uh, and you have to have different goals as an artist. We're, are we out of time? We are. <laughs> oh, that's, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>